I'm Tommy Reddix, Executive Director from, from Paramount School of Excellence. We're a K-8 charter school on the near east side of Indianapolis, starting our seventh year of school. And I'm Stephanie Ritter. I'm the Special Education Director there and a Special Education Teacher as well. So we're going to really give you some oversight into who we are as a school, some of the challenges we faced as we started as a school and grown into a seven-year charter. Uh, we're about to open our second charter school next year, so we'll be giving birth to another program and having to go through a lot of these new startup things uh, with special education and charter schools and kids and accessibility. And um, so hopefully we bring some relevance to what's going on and we'll, we'll get into a, a very nifty handout that I really think is cool and worth your while and some case studies and situations that we've been in as we go along. All right, I'm gonna start just by kind of going over our history of our school. So Paramount opened in 2010. Um, you can kind of see where our total population and our special education population has grown. So starting off in 2010, we had a population of 368 and a special education population of 53, which was about 14.4% of our population. The next year, you can see our enrollment really grew a lot as our general ed students with 462. Our special ed population pretty much stayed about the same, um, bumping us down to that 11.9%. You see a big growth in population in 2012. So this is, we have some footing down, people who are starting to know more about our school. So we see an increase in the overall population and the special education population. 2012 to 2013, that's around when I started at the school, um, you see a really big jump there. <laughs> um, we went from 68 special education students to 96 special education students. So it was a big adjustment for me personally when we went from the 68 to the 96, jumping our total SPED population to 17.9%. <coughs> So there's definitely some adjustment there. Since that time, you can see our special education population has remained about the same. We've increased about the same rate that the overall population has increased. Currently, we're at the 700 with 117 special education students. We have quite a few initials going on in our school, though, um, either from last year at the end of the year requesting of testing or beginning of this year. So I see our numbers rising. Um, I think we have about six in the testing process right now. So you can see a big increase there. So the question is about our special education staff. Um, and we have me, who I'm a special education director. I oversee all grades K through eight. In addition to that, I also do pullout groups um, for grades K through five. We have a six through eight reading specialist, and we have a six through eight math specialist who actually does a lot of push-in. And then we also have a, an instructional assistant. You can see some of our demographics there, so you get into a, a quick overview of what our population looks like. So some of our operations at Paramount, we do have quite a few English language learners. So we have a full-time ELL director. They do pull, daily pull out with groups to work on the English language skills with a real focus on their vocabulary, their reading, and their writing because those are the areas that they struggle in most. Um, we align all of our lessons to the curriculum, we create individual learning plans for those students that include accommodations. We have professional development for our staff on ELL students. Some of the challenges that we come into when we talk about ELL students is incorporating the various cultures into daily lessons and the cultural differences. We want to make sure that we're being culturally sensitive to all students, so we want to involve curriculum and lessons that involve those other cultures. Okay, so we kind of, they hit on this at the beginning, with the multi-tiered system of supports or MTSS and academics that kind of replaced our RTI system. So we still have this where we focus, um, we have a director that leads the team um, to make decisions in terms of RTI. We um, discuss the student's progress and we set up interventions for those students. They can be specific for academic or behavior. So students can say, I have the student, they're really struggling in this area of reading, I really wanna work on that. Or they can come in and say, I have this student who's really struggling with their behavior. This is something I would wanna look at. Um, and because both myself and the ELL director are involved in those meetings, I also kind of get a heads up of where that student is. So if I hear students having a lot of behavioral problems and they're starting these interventions, that's someone that I kind of want to have in the back of my mind that I recognize um, and try to help and build supports for those students. So we have our tier one, which is our core. That's just going to be what we do for all of our students. It's a classroom expectation of universal practices. Tier two is more targeted. We're going to focus on those at-risk students. 
We're going to have a lot more parent in, uh, communication. We have a lot of parent communication already, but we're going to focus more on exactly what that individual student needs and communicate that with the parents. That's a big part of this system, is that if you're not communicating with parents, if they get through all two, three tiers and at the end of the time I go, hey, they've been going through this process, you know, they're not really responding to the interventions, we want to put them in special education. If a parent has never heard of what is going on with their child, that's a really hard conversation to have um, for the special education teachers. And our tier three are those really intensive um, interventions that we're doing. They are individualized for each student. Documentation is a big part of that too, proving that you are doing those interventions. Now, MTSS is a very confusing title because we're all very familiar with RTI, and uh, RTI has been kind of the commonplace uh, title that we've had on supporting kids on multiple tiers for years. And I think, um, in looking at MTS, MTSS, you could consider MTSS a larger umbrella to catch singular focuses like RTI, where RTI was very focused on students who might not be making the grade and you can set up your interventions to try to meet those needs as the kids move forward. MTSS can, can serve not only those kids who are suffering, but can also be a multi-tiered system of supports for high ability. It can be a multi-tiered system of supports for behavior. So uh, this is one example of how we'll deal with behavior, where we would set up the same tiering system with a tier one school-wide behavior management system, tier two uh, discipline support, Tier 3, administrative discipline control of what's going on with the student behavior. Um, going along with the MTSS is also the universal design for learning, which is just providing material in multiple ways. Having We do whole brain teaching, we do guided notes, we have many lessons, we think pair share. So it's really providing curriculum so that all students have access to it. Um, multiple ways to check for student, support, or student understanding throughout your lessons, allowing accommodations and modifications in the classroom, and allowing choice to show understanding, particularly for those younger kids being able to draw a picture, giving students if they have to write a paragraph, letting them write it on a PowerPoint, if that's the best way that they're going to be able to present what they know. The de detailing some more operations of who we are and how we operate, we've created what's called a new teacher academy. So we do teacher training for teachers who are not only new teachers to the profession, but new to our school. So we can provide supports for those who just aren't familiar with our culture. And we'll have that last more than the initial year. So you'll get two years of indoctrination in that program before you kind of graduate out and you're officially one of the gang. Um, these uh, new teacher academy teachers will participate in their own professional development series. Uh, a lot of it is teacher-led, teacher-driven. Um, there's not a ton of teach and preach. It's very practical, usable information, uh, classroom observations, good feedback and roundtables provided. We also provide PD monthly at staff meetings. Um, this is a really great practice that I would wish upon all of you. So at any time, your special education director, if that's you or if that's someone you're here with, does any talk to staff, do a sign-in sheet, and that has officially documented your training of staff on whatever topic you just rolled out. And that can come back and really help you down the road if there's a concern or complaint over the processes in your school. Um, weekly grade level team meetings. Um, we do weekly grade level team meetings for all of our staff. So our staff, for the most part, have common planning time. And at least once a week during that common planning time, there will be a scheduled meeting with administration so you can get a check-in for what's going on there. And those weekly check-ins will usually feature a different department in the school. So typically monthly, we would have a visit by special education with administration during that time to make sure that the team is working well, uh, interventions are being met, and uh, IEPs are being followed. So this slide kind of gives you a look into what the special education in our room looks like, how we function on a daily basis. So when we talk about least restrictive environment, a majority of our students are in the general education setting. We either do pull out or push in groups. For the younger kids, we do a lot of pull out. Um, they tend to need kind of more than that small group setting. For six through eight math, due to our I-step scores, they're rather high. And so we do a lot of push in there because that is the best way to teach those kids. We have to accommodate the best way for them in their least restrictive environment. We always align our lessons to the general education setting. So every Friday, teachers email me their lesson plans. From there, if they're working on main idea, my lessons are gonna incorporate main idea. If it's a fifth grade lesson on main idea and I have the low fifth grade group, we may do it at a third grade level, but we're still gonna work on that main idea concept. So we really align the curriculum to what the gen ed is doing 
it's awesome when I'm teaching a group and kids will go, hey, we just did this upstairs. I'm like, perfect, that's exactly what I want because I just want them to be being reinforced on those skills. They are expected to pass I-STEP, so that is what we're working towards. Challenges with this are doing accommodations and modifications while in the general ed setting. That is something that I have to oversee. I have teachers sign off it on it every quarter. They have to sign off on paperwork stating that they understand the accommodations and modifications for students, and if they don't, they have to speak to me before they sign off. So that's just another way to kind of protect us if we ever did get a complaint filed saying, well, you don't have your teachers sign off on this or read their IEPs, I can say, yeah, here's my evidence of doing that. We do resource room. Those are going to be more intensive, frequent instruction based on the data. Um, again, modified curriculum for students. Challenges are staffing and scheduling. You definitely have to adjust the way um, the teachers are being used in the classroom to make sure that you get those service minutes in. The other thing we have is a self-contained, or we call it a modified self-contained. The reason it's modified is because we only have one classroom in our school for special education. So because of that, we have a self-contained student, but there are other students coming in and out of that classroom. So we put students in a modified self-contained if they are high behavioral needs or they're disruptive to the general education setting. Um, sometimes if they're greatly below grade level, they would also have to be in the self-contained setting. So we either do grade level curriculum then or it's dependent on their academic data. Challenges, again, staffing is a big one. You have a student in your room full time. You have to have someone that it can educate them in there. Scheduling again. Um, and then the behavioral impact on others. When you have a student that is coming in and causing a disruption in the special education room, you have to find a way to still educate those other students that need a group. So those are kind of what our classroom settings look like at Paramount. And I know in our first two years as a school, we had one room and one special education director, and that was it. And that's how we began as a school. And, and that was, there was a lot of discomfort and pain and growing through that process. And as we've matured more as a school and our student population has risen, we've been able to backfill that staff and support our kids that much more. So in terms of accessibility, uh, we feel like we go way over the top and we're very proud of that. There's a catch to that at the end of this slide. But um, some of our examples of an accessible school site would be access to one-on-one -on -one for students that require classroom support. Um, all the modifications necessary in physical education, access to the playground and equipment. We even have a modified swing for disabilities. Uh, we've got changing tables installed around the school. We work with outside vendors, speak, speech, language, pathologists, occupational therapy, physical therapy, the Center for Deaf and Hard of Hearing to provide needed services as students arrive. Um, elevators and ramps for mobility, assistive technology devices, computers, iPads, Alpha Smart FM systems, um, we've got an accessible pad poured through our outdoor greenhouse. We're putting an accessible trail through the Peace Park on the side of our school. Um, we've got accessibility to our gardening and our backyard. We love that stuff, but it's all there because we have to have it. And that's the catch. If somebody says it's inaccessible, then we're subject to lawsuit, and that's a spooky thing. Any, anybody who would walk up with a student with special needs and their disability said that, hey, you need to have this so my child can have this access to education, our response has to be, okay, we're on it. Whether we can afford it or want it or don't want it, it's law. So we're very accessible as a campus, and some of those lessons we've learned the hard way, but since then we've learned to kind of go all in, and it's been a big help for us. So this is just percent of population. In 2006, approximately 13.5% of all students in K through 12 schools were in special education. Um, those numbers have probably risen since 2006, but just kind of put us in perspective of where we're at. We are currently at 17%, and IPS, which is really the neighboring district where students, if they didn't come to Paramount, would go there, um, is at 18%. So you can see we're right aligned with them. So the next thing we're going to share with you is our handout. Um, and as we're trying to talk you through a day in the life of Paramount School of Excellence, uh, we may not be the perfect model in the state of Indiana. We may not be a great model for you to try to mirror yourself off of as being a, another charter school. But at least you get a glimpse of something to compare yourselves to. And uh, I know that Stephanie put a lot of time into this handout. And I think it's really, really cool because what we tried to do in a one-pager is capture a year in the life of the special education program. 
and all of the little things that you would have to do from point to point to point. And I guarantee we've missed 100 things on this list, but at least we have a one pager where you could say, hey, are we doing that? Are we doing that? And uh, I, I love it as I've dove into it. I think it's going to be an ongoing resource for us that we can dynamically update from year to year. So I'm going to disappear from camera view, so I hope I don't upset anybody on that one as I walk to hand these out. I'll be right back. So as you're going to, it's just, it's color coded and goes through my process that I typically take from new enrollment um, through teacher training, through move-in conferences, annual case reviews, initial evaluations, how we handle discipline, how we look at um, behavior plans and we maintain those, um, how we work with transition students, what we do for state assessments, and then at the end of the year to get ready. This is definitely something that's taken me five years to get the hang of. Um, so it's really something that I've developed, and we'll talk more about how some of our plans and um, procedures have come into place. But it really is kind of a quick note of how we typically run the special education department. All right, thank you, Chris. So we're going to get into one of my favorite topics, and that's myth busting. Um, there are a lot of myths about special education in charter schools, and still a lot of prevalent ones in the state of Indiana. And this is almost word for word. If you watched this or attended this last year, what we talked about last year, we might have changed a few things around on these myths as far as what order comes in, or what myth comes in what order. But I still find it fascinating that a lot of these myths are out there and still strong. So we're going to cover a few of them. The biggest one I see out there that I continue to hear is that charter schools do not have to serve special education students with needs that exceed the school's staffing or facility capacity. Um, I don't know if you've heard the same things out there, but I think these kind of myths hurt us all terribly. That there are some serious laws out there that prohibit us from following through on a myth like this. So we all need to get on the same page as far as um, what federal law dictates and how we roll that out in the state. So charter schools. Another part of this myth is that charter schools don't have to accept students with special needs. We know that that is definitely untrue. Charter schools are not required to have a special education program. Um, that can be a sticky wicket. You might not have a program, but you certainly need to serve those students, have a, somebody who's managing that IEP who is representing that school. So if you don't have a program, I hope you're subcontracting one because you would need a setup like that to be compliant. A charter school special education law is dictated by the school's charter and is upheld by the school's authorizer and not any other agency. Complete myth. We all have a charter if we're charter schools. That charter basically gives us the right to open our doors. But that charter doesn't trump federal law. And it doesn't trump Article 7. So those are things that we have to do no matter what. And so just because we have a charter to be a charter school, that doesn't mean that we only follow that as our guidepost. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Another myth, charter schools don't have to report to the IDOE for special education. Um, that is a myth. If you don't report to the IDOE as they ask, they come knocking at your door, and it's usually not a happy knock because we're all responsible for these kids. Uh, another one, charter schools are not subject to IDOE special education audits. How many in this room have gone through a special education program audit? All right. Decent amount of hands. Um, you learn what you don't know in an audit every time. And there's no such thing as a feel-good audit. I mean, that's just <laughs> practicality in, in terms of education or business or anything else. Audits are no fun. But you come out of an audit knowing what you weren't doing right or what you didn't know, and then you have a chance to fix it. But if the special education department says, this is your turn for an audit, well, they're going to show up at your door, and they have the right to do so. Another thing about special education is it's litigious and it's legitimate. Litigious meaning it gets very legal very quickly. Legitimate meaning there's nothing you can do about it. You have to follow the law. In terms of legitimacy, the students who in our case make up almost 20% of our student body probably won't succeed without us paying careful attention to their needs. And if I start doing simple math on 20% of my student body and I'm not doing a good job as an educator for those students, that's potentially 20% of my ISTEP for performance going as did not pass. And if I lose 20% of ISTEP performance before I even get to the general body of students in my school, what are my chances for 
being an A, B, or C school. Not very good. So I'm probably already looking at myself as a focus or priority school if I'm not taking care of and massaging that 20% of my population that's going to be out there testing. So there's a very legitimate reason to take that population very seriously, if you weren't already. It's shame on you if you weren't. But here's some extra oomph, is those kids do matter. And their scores will matter for your school. And our accountability as charter schools is very, very touch and go. We can be shut down like this for two reasons. If our finances are poor or our academics are poor. And suddenly we're not a school anymore. And this population can be a gateway to keeping your doors open too. And that's maybe a very negative way of looking at it, but it also really takes that population of kids and puts them on a higher plateau. Number two, an overwhelming majority of legal cases brought against schools are special education cases. So if your school is going to be sued over anything, I'd be willing to bet 99% of the time it's going to be a special education issue. And if you know that's the case coming into this, then that should really also heighten your awareness to dotting your I's, crossing your T's, and ensuring you're following the law. So speaking of litigious, I don't know if there is a charter school in Indiana that will ever survive its tenure and its charter without getting complaints filed against it or, or having to deal with lawsuits. We've had our fair share, and we have not been perfect by any means, but we've learned a lot. So what we've done is we've kind of changed some names and changed some issues, so we've de-identified our situations, but kept them relevant to the reasonings that they were brought to light, complaints that were brought against us, so we could talk through what that complaint looked like, how we dealt with it, and then some of the um, responses from the state and their kind of corrective actions for us. So hopefully these will shed some light on what you may be facing or similar situations that you've been through. Um, in terms of advocacy, uh, you have to realize that a parent of a child with special needs is going to advocate a lot stronger than your average school parent. Why? Because they already know their child has special needs. They already recognize there's different needs that need to be met. And so they're going to be walking into you with a heightened awareness of what they're going to want you to do to make their child successful. So understand that you're deal dealing with a parent population that's already showing up to your door, ready to go. And um, that, can, that can have things boiling over very quickly if you're not prepared for it. Um, state and federal law, it's IDEA, I'm getting ahead of our slide, mm -hmm. IDEA and Article 7 protect these kids and force our hands, if we're not doing our job correctly, to do it the right way. Um, there are multiple advocacy groups in the state of Indiana ready to jump in when families need support. Every time you hand out those parent rights, there's typically something on the back page that tells the parent where they can call if they need help or advocacy. And then they can get that advocate to show up at the school with them next time to help guide that process and make sure they're getting what they need. Um, when a parent or an advocacy group is no longer happy with how things are going at your school, you're likely to get a complaint. And don't need to do a show of hands on that one, but I will tell you that we have had complaints filed against us, and it's been a, an amazing learning experience. Uh, complaints can often be solved, rectified within 30 to 60 days. Some of them can stretch on to four months, five months, six months, a year, depending on how serious it is and how much mediation it may take to get that thing resolved. The expense for something like that, as it starts to move in and even get into a lawsuit or, some, or an appeal, you could be looking between $5,000 and $25,000, I've got even 50 on the slide, for the expense to your school for a complaint and the process that you exhaust yourself with trying to deal with that complaint. And for a lot of us as charter schools, that's a heavy, heavy price. So we're not going to engage in that unless we really feel that it's in the best interest of the child. It's no longer about pride, about who's right or who's wrong. So like Tommy said, we're going to kind of go through some situations. We've kind of edited, you know, we took out names, obviously, and the situations maybe changed a little bit, but situations that have occurred to us in terms of um, complaints being filed. So our first case was, um, the complaint was that the school expelled an ED student inappropriately. The school did not provide for services during the process of the expulsion. So some of the details of this, a student brought into the school or brought um, a drug into the school building and was showing and sharing it with other students. Proof was contested alongside claims that the reasons for expulsion were invalid. Parent partnered with an advocate agency and report, um, which brought an advocate to the manifestation hearing. 
And at that time, all parties answered no. Those were kind of the two big point, the two big questions that were talked about earlier. Um, did it have to do with the child's disability have a direct and substantial relationship? We said no. Was it due to the school's failure to implement the IEP? Everyone agreed no. Following the manifestation, the school moved to expel the student, and then a DOE complaint was filed. So what happened from there was it was found the student ex facing expulsion was handled correctly. We were allowed to expel that student. But what we did fail to do was to make up services not offered during the period of investigation, the manifestation, and the expulsion. So that 11th day change of placement was something that we had forgotten to do. We should have immediately had a change of placement meeting to figure out those services. The parent then added further needs by insisting that the school provide extended school year services since the school was providing a summer school program. And we met that request by that parent. So all in total, that case took us four months. So in a, in a lot of back and forth and a lot of hardship. So we felt we had a very strong situation where you have a student brought drugs to school and shared drugs with others. And in the end, we were mostly right. Yes, you shouldn't bring drugs and share it with others at school, but during that process of figuring out what was going to happen with the child, we weren't providing enough services to that child. And because the expulsion lasted during the summertime, and we did have a summer school program, the parent was within their right to request that that child also receive extended year services during the summer to parallel the same services that would be going out in the school. All right, our second case. The school was deliberately avoiding ED classifications by referring troubled students straight to mental and behavioral services without referring for special education. So at our school, we have Cummins Behavioral Health, which is an outside organization that comes into the school. So that's what they're referring to when, we said, when it says the mental and behavioral services. So the details of this was that outside third party filed this complaint with the DOE. The complaint provides firsthand accusations insinuating the school was not following referral or child fine policy. The school was asked to provide proof of the students that had been qualified as well as the disabilities of those students. The school had to provide a list of students submitted to the mental and behavioral health, and the school had to submit its policies and procedures for referrals for evaluations. So essentially, we were being accused of avoiding classifying students as ED, just by sticking them in a behavioral health service. And the complaint wasn't coming from within the school. So it was coming from an outside party. So it was a surprising complaint for us. But like anything else, or like the word audit that I mentioned earlier, we may not like it, but suddenly we're in it. And it was then time for us to document our processes and provide everything we could to substantiate that we weren't doing this. The problem is, how do you substantiate something you're not doing? And when it comes to the law, that's a real sticky wicket. When it comes to special education, it's something every time someone says, yeah, document that, have that parent send you an email, write that down and stick it in a file. It sounds impossibly tedious. It sounds like a, a horrible time task. But trying to prove the state that you didn't do anything when nothing was done, it's a double negative. We lost. The state essentially said, no, you can't prove that you weren't doing this because you had no documentation showing that you weren't doing this. I had asked, got asked if I had a conversation with teachers, any conversations with teachers about this, and I said no, and they asked me if I could provide documentation of it. And I was like, I don't know how I provide conversation, documentation of conversations that I didn't have. And th their point was valid. Mm -hmm. They are saying, you still have to prove it. You have an accusation that this is happening. Can you prove that it's not? And we're like, well, of course it's not. But it's such a circular reference. And so really, really interesting case as it played out. Um, so the school was found not to have committed any fault in child find or lack of qualification. The school was required to create a parent form that allowed um, acknowledgement of whether special education services were needed or wanted at the time um, that we refer to the mental health services. Um, and the school board was also involved in it and had to play a large role in mediating the process as well. So essentially, we had to create a new step to putting kids into our Cummins Behavioral Health, where we have a form, those forms come to me, I meet with the team, I talk to parent, and on the form we directly write, no, the child does not need special education services at this time, and we have sign-off on it, and then I submit that paperwork to the Cummins Health. Yeah. 
So a lot of schools do subcontracted uh, mental and behavioral health services. I think Cummins is a big provider. Midtown's a big provider. There's a couple others out there. This is not what, what the state told us to do is not special education law. It's not in Article 7. It's not in IDEA. This was a recommendation by state attorneys to safeguard our processes because this is a double negative. How else would we be able to prove that a step was taken to ensure that we're not trying to slough off potential ED students into a counseling track so we could lessen the load on our special education staff? That sounds devious, but the only way to do it would be to put a step in there. And so we weren't being told, law says that you must do this. We were being told this, that we couldn't prove that we were doing it, and here's the recommendation from the state to do it. And when we get a recommendation from the state, we do it because it's, it's coming on pretty good authority that that's going to be a benefit for our school. It seems very counter to providing child or providing any child good service. So if a child really needs counseling, but you can't get that child into that behavioral health service fast enough because you have to slow the process down to contact the parent to get a sign off, yes, that's tedious. But for the organization, it provides a great layer of security. So this case took us three months, and this case has actually come back to save us probably two or three additional times, where we had a case where a student was on their way out the door for behavioral reasons, uh, something very extreme on the behavior side that had gotten them up for either a long-term suspension where the parent was, was really hostile or a potential expulsion. And the parent then turned right around and said, no, but my child has special needs and you weren't serving my child. And we would say, wait a second, we have this document that shows that you didn't want your child to receive any special education services at this date. And that, as a case, was right. brought to us by the state as a complaint where we won the complaint. Right. So, and at that time, the parent also refused come in. Not only did she refuse special education services, but she refused come in services as well. So on two different ways that we try to provide support, she said no. Cummins is, is just a subcontractor for mental and behavioral health services. Mm -hmm. We provide them an office in the school, but they are not our employees. Okay. And so we refer children to them, and then they do Medicaid reimbursements to serve those kids. Do they, also yeah. they do their own evaluations. And we'll, like if I have a special education student that's in Cummins, we have quite a few, then I will invite that Cummins person to our, you know, our ACRs so that they can have input. And we work alongside each other, even though we are in separate. The really cool thing about Cummins um, is that they also work with parents at home. So a lot of times, if we have kids, um, when we refer them to Cummins and not to special education, it's typically because there's something going on at home um, versus something at school. So unintentional plug for Cummins Behavioral Health Services. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Case number three. I'll dive in and let you awesome. finish up. So the complaint for our third case study was that the school didn't comply with a student's behavior intervention plan prior to suspension. So, kind of caught in a technicality, it seemed. The situation was the child with an IEP assaults another student in the halls. The parent, after debriefing with the child, then disagrees with the school's decision. The parent then involves an attorney pursuing a notion that the child cannot be suspended since the action had a direct and substantial relationship to the child's disability. Following a refusal by the school to rescind the suspension, the parent filed an idea week complaint that the behavior intervention plan was not followed. So you've got multiple layers here. Um, there, is, there is an ongoing parent argument very strong that you may not discipline my child if it had to do with their disability. Now, state law clearly says that yes, you may, up to 10 days, but remember, once you hit 10, the rules completely change. So you definitely, if you remember from Tracy this morning, there's a lot of things to consider when you're talking about discipline in special education students. But in this case, the school was in good right to say, no, we're going to suspend your child for this assault. We haven't hit a 10-day threshold, but the parent thought it was time to get an attorney. So the resolution there is that the idea we found that the behavior intervention plan was not followed even though the school attempted to follow the behavior intervention plan, but disengaged when the child refused to participate. So the scenario played out to where the school did everything the intervention plan said. It said, when you have an incident and something happens, you need to then go de-escalate using an unpacking procedure with the child to make sure that you can kind of help de-escalate the child back to a norm. Well, in that process of de-escalation, the child refused to participate. And so the de-escalation process and unpacking stops. 
And that was documented beautifully. And that documentation to the state read like this. Attempted behavior plan, decided not to follow through. And so then we were cited for not following the behavior plan. So even though we tried and the child wasn't cooperative with that behavior plan, we then disengaged. And so lesson learned. So that changed the way with this particular student or any student that has unpacking in their IEP, which for us unpacking means we go through the events of the situation. We then ask the student how they felt throughout those events. We then ask them how did the other person feel throughout those events. And we come up with ways to change that behavior next time. Instead of now, if that child shuts down during those cases, we tend to just walk him through that process ourselves. So usually he will engage with us. How are you feeling? He'll answer. Um, we've all been in special education, so we can pretty much guess, okay, why did you do this? You did this because you were upset. How do you think the other person felt when you kicked them? That person was sad that you kicked them. So instead of attempting and not following through just because he didn't want to participate, I now still talk him through that situation. I'm still unpacking with him. I'm still giving him the tools to be successful next time, even if he doesn't want to verbally do that um, unpacking with me. So it seems very tedious to have a two-month complaint go through the process involving attorneys because of a behavior intervention plan that was started and stopped. But it's still, legally, we didn't do it right. We got close, and then we learned our lesson. So more than anything, complaints for us much easier to say is a seven-year charter school. Having been there all seven years myself, I get a lot less fear when a complaint comes our way than I did my first couple of years where I thought the world was falling on top of me and you know, you always feel like the next thing's going to shut you down or the next thing's going to make everything horrible, you're going to get fired. But your complaint's like an audit or a systems test. They don't do anything more but tell you what you're doing wrong or how you can improve. Um, my personal prideful goal with every complaint is to have the state have no findings when they check everything out and say, nope, you're doing a great job. And I think in the history of our school, that's happened twice. And we've had a lot of the other side come up. But as you can see with some of these results for what's happened in our complaints, it's never a, you are wrong. You're out of here. I can't believe you're doing that. It's always, okay, I see you've done this. What I would like to do is recommend your school now goes through and does this. I'd like you to include a training to your staff on this, and we're done. And once that's done, the parent signs off on that and we're moving forward. So it's, it's never a, a brutal punch in the face, but it is a learning process. Um, and I say there's no better test for a system than a real world accusation that you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. Because that tends to get most of us fairly efficient, effective, and working really hard to prove how good we are, which is a cool thing. Um, complaints are a process. We enter into each one hoping to win. Then we make corrections and we move forward. So. Compliance then, compliance with compliance, um, compliance added on to compliance, compliance multiplied by compliance. That kind of is the, the field that we're all in right here. Um, but past findings from the IDOE we can be helpful because from that we can do the following. We can create better procedures. We didn't know what we were doing wrong. That happens to us all too often in audits is you just don't know what you don't know. And so you have to be dynamic about the policies and procedures you're creating in your programs. You have to know that it's going to morph and it's going to change over time and it's going to improve over time if you pay it serious attention. Uh, participating in multiple amazingly exciting professional development opportunities like this one. Um, that was a great plug for Steven Yaki, the very back over there. <laughs> Not <paying> attention. Uh, <laughs> continuing conversations with the IDUE on how to improve. I can't tell you how important it is to maintain a relationship with those people that are above you in the Department of Education. Um, you can call it brown nosing, you can call it friend making, you can call it a security blanket, but if the people who are helping you work through problems at the Department of Education don't know who you are, human nature is human nature. You don't have that relationship, are they really going to bat for you, who's the squeak of your wheel, you never know what's in the balance, and so you want to establish relationships. You want to invite those folks out to your school to walk you through policies and procedures. You want to throw your questions directly to the top. Everybody says they have an open door policy. Abuse it. That'd be great. I think a lot of them would love to have their phones ringing that way because those are positive <laughs> calls. That's not the angry parent phone call that really zaps all the emotional energy out of you. Allow your authorizer to audit special education every year instead of every other. Uh, most authorizers, authorizers only do uh, reviews of your program every two years. Invite anyone in to review your program. Bring in anybody to say, hey, tell me what I'm doing wrong. What do you see here? And then complaints from outside the IDOE, 
We had one of those that really stirred the pot for us for quite a while. They do create better forms of documentation. We told you about the new form we had to create that wasn't proven and pushed by law, but really helped our school out over time. They assist in the creation of more concise policies and procedures. They provide professional development for all staff. Again, we didn't ask for it when the complaint knocks on your door, but we are better for it. And it's easier to say on this side of it. It's always no fun when it first hits you. So we just threw a lot of information at you for who and how we were. Any questions on what goes on at our school or any comparisons you might have at your school or case studies that have stirred your brains? Yes. Yes, the question was that we're opening a new school next year, and where was it, here in India or somewhere else? Uh, we've partnered with the Mind Trust for an innovation charter school, so we'll be partnering with IPS somewhere in IPS. So we're excited about that, but that process takes a long time for the uh, IPS Office of Innovation and the Mind Trust in our school to collaborate and come up with the best uh, innovation scenario. But downtown somewhere in the IPS area. Other questions? Okay, feel free to interrupt as we move on. And I think we have five minutes left. That's perfect. All right, we mentioned this earlier. This is your wake-up call. IDEA, here's the hardest question of the day. Does anybody know what it is? So that's my idea of a joke. Thank you for laughing. All right. <laughs> it's on the screen. Um, is IDEA, IDEA state or federal? Federal, yes. The big driver of the boat. Below IDEA, we have this great word called FAPE. Again, I would ask you for the definition, but I'm just going to go ahead and help you. <laughs> that was also very funny. Uh, free, appropriate public education and educational right of children with disabilities in the United States that is guaranteed by the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 and IDEA. These are federal mandates for compliance. These trump your authorizer. If your charter school contract says you don't have to follow these two things, you still have to follow these two things. If your charter school contract does say you don't have to follow these two things, I'd love to talk to your authorizer. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it won't. Uh, we can't ignore these as a charter. This is just who we are and how we do business the right way. So then the last couple things here in our last couple minutes, the differences between the authorizer relationship, if you're a charter school, you serve an authorizer, and the state relationship in special education. That can sometimes be confusing. So there are differences between authorizer and state. Uh, the main thing comes down to a finding. If you have a state finding, it's going to be a legal opinion with specific steps in areas to make improvement. A legal finding is telling you that you need to make a change. It's like getting a legal audit comment. It's telling you that there was a material weakness in your finances and you need to make a change. It's the same thing in your special education program. So when a state talks, it's like the old E.F. Hutton thing, people listen. It's a really dated joke. Um, a concern from an authorizer about your special education program. Well, that's a concern. That's an idea for future change. That is not a state mandate. That's not a federal mandate. So if your authorizer says, I'm really concerned about your special ed program, I don't think you're meeting the needs of these kids here or there, well, that's something you might want to look into because if the state gets on board with that, there's going to be a legal finding and you're going to have to affect change. So more differences between authorizer and state. What's the difference between an auditor or an authorizer review and a state review? And I already mentioned the magic word there, and that's auditor. An authorizer review is going to be your annual re review as a charter to make sure that you're hitting benchmarks according to your charter. Your authorizer is going to look at that and say, all right, you're making good progress here as a charter, or you're not, so we really need to talk. Well, a review by the state is going to be your special education audit. And I already know there was five or six hands that went up in the room of folks who have gone through your audit locally. Um, it's a lot of work and proof of what you're doing, but it's a good thing for your program, and again, knowing what you don't know. And then the last slide we have just goes back to our notion of communication. You need to establish those relationships. Um, you will never do a better job than opening your arms to anybody to look at your program. It can be a very spooky thing to do when you're on an island, but the more people you let know about how you're doing what you do, the more you're protecting yourself in your process, and the more you're getting the expertise to back what you're trying to do as a school. That's it for us. Any other questions before we finish? All right, thank you very much. Thank you so much.